you. Awesome. Okay, I believe we can all see it. So B2B marketing and sales foundation. Tonight in the remaining minutes that we have, I'm going to endeavor to be able to get you to a place where your mindset is opened to the infinite possibilities that lie in the B2B market. Uh, my goal is that I may encourage you, inspire you to venture into B2B marketing or consider a B2B model in your already existing business. So like I do always, I'm gonna take time to share with you an introduction and why this is important because I believe we attach relevance when we see why it benefits us. And I'm gonna show you why this is beneficial for you, why being here tonight will make the difference. If that's you tonight and you're excited to get in, allow me to just move into the next slide. So a bit about B2B marketing that you may know or may not know. And the first question we'd love to ask is, what then is B2B marketing and sales? All right, so B2B, for those that don't know, is business to business. So business to business sales, business to business marketing. And this is where the businesses in the market sell to each other. All right. Uh, this is where businesses market and sell to other businesses as their customer or their clients. So when you as a business person that owns an enterprise decides to open up and get into the business to business market and sell to another business, it could be you being able to supply reams of paper to companies around you. It could be you being the go-to person to offer a service to different companies, whether it's graphic. We can see businesses in Zambia like Black Dot, Stimuli PR, that particular crew that works with a lot of PR and they deal with stuff like branding, brand activation. They've got a largely B2B model when you look at how they are positioned. Ulendo in Zambia also has a B2B model with their Ulendo business, where they charge about, I don't know, it should be 90, for about one kilometer, there's about 19. Point nine quarter, if I'm not mistaken. They've got a B2B model. In Zambia, we also get to see a number of businesses that accommodate a B2B model. And so you might want to ask yourself then, is this something for you? And I want to labor to be able to share that for you tonight. Uh, according to LinkedIn earning, they, they define you know, B2B sales as selling to someone acting on behalf of the company the work. So you see, with B2C, which is business to consumer, you are selling to the end consumer, someone who's actually going to use your product, whether it's a product that's a long reach product, whether it's a product that's a cake, you are selling to the end consumer. But then with the B2B model, you are selling to someone who is acting on behalf of the company. And this is a different ball game altogether, right? Because Perhaps the person you're selling to doesn't even use the product. They are selling, they are buying it as a professional in a professional capacity. And already this begins to show you how the dynamics around the sale become different because your end consumer may be buying out of an emotional uh, state because they love the product. They are going to be using it. You know, they, 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 they have that behavior tailored around emotions and then, they are able to immediately value whether they want it or not. But the professional buyer who's buying on behalf of the company, their mindset is going to be different. You know, They are buying mostly on a rational basis. They want the best deal. Probably they're taking more deals than one and they're looking at them. They've asked for deals to come in. And they are thinking of quality. They are thinking of how they can balance up things like finance for the company. There's all those things that come into play. So I'm gonna get into those in, in a bit more detail, but I wanted to open the stage to you that the B2B market and sales space is different from our normal B2C businesses, which I believe most of us are in right now. Probably you're selling to the end consumer, the, the person that's going to use it. If it's an app, it's the end user. And that brings a whole different ball game. And so this is not something that you just think, you know all of a sudden, if you've been doing B2B sales, B2C, sorry, sales, B2 consumer sales, then this session may be great for you if you're looking to get into B2B. You never underestimate the power of knowledge. At Make Life International, 
we have got our idea capital development process. Actually, there's a book available for you called Idea Capital Development. It's available in ebook form. You, I'm going to share contacts at the end if you want to read it. But one of the core factors or the core pillars that we set is knowledge. And we say that to bring any idea into reality, you can never underestimate the power of knowledge, which we call the advantage bringer. So if you're in here tonight, I want you to just go ahead and type into the chat box advantage, because what you're about to learn in the next session is advantage. So kindly go ahead and just type in advantage. Let me get to see. Okay, I see an advantage there. Thank you so much for Marion. Let me get to see a number of advantages typed into the chat box so that I can dive into this because you're about to get into some great knowledge here. Great to see Tisa and saying advantage, amazing. Let me get to see more. At least 50% of the crew tonight. I want to see if we're into this. How many of you want that advantage? Hankomo says advantage. Simba says advantage. Thank you so much. Advantage from faith. Advantage is pouring in. Amazing. So I'm about to share with you knowledge on how you can now frame your B2B market strategy and your sales campaign. So what we'll look at tonight, and I'm going to share this, and I'm going to do a lot of speaking today, so I'm going to have this shared with you. I haven't got a text-heavy PowerPoint tonight. And it's kind of a bit deliberate, though, uh, but I want to be able to communicate it because, you know, this, this is stuff that you should be able to get to understand, not just listen, but they must get in, engraved in you right now. So we're going to look at why the B2B market should be considered, okay? Uh, introduction to the B2B sales and marketing and B2B marketing and sales processes, okay? So there's a process for buying and for selling, and there's a process around all that. So why then should we consider the B2B market? You know, why don't we just stay B2C? Why shouldn't I just be comfortable with selling to um, Mr. George along the, the road, you know? Maybe sell to his children some, uh, some drinks like uh, Red Bull and uh, what's this other drink? Uh, these dragon drinks, you know, so that he's not slapping his children. No, that's supposed to be a joke. But the question is, why shouldn't I focus on B2C marketing or in B2B sales? And this is some of the reasons. B2B is very lucrative. And when I say lucrative, I mean B2B marketing and sales. Marketing being the generation of interest and sales being the closing of a deal. This is where the money actually comes in, right? Uh, so the money goes into the marketing. The money comes in after the sales. So B2B marketing and sales tend to be very lucrative. This is because companies, businesses normally have the money. They have got the money. If you look at the total that a company itself is valued at, it's way more than any individual on the planet is valued at. I mean, if you look at valuations of some of the biggest companies we have, like Microsoft, Amazon, they are valued in the billions of dollars. We're not just talking about billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to 300 billion, some of them. They've got so much valuation such that people like Jeff Bezos, who owns a good share of his enterprise, can have 100 billion. But you wouldn't be able to buy Amazon because the other time they reached a trillion dollar valuation. So you see, businesses have the money. And as that can vividly be seen on a worldwide scale of how, uh, say, for example, Amazon, which has been doing quite fine, especially during this COVID time, owns, is worth over trillions. And even our own Tredkins within this space has got, is worth billions today. You can see that there's already a big margin between how much an enterprise an entity such as an enterprise can own as compared to how much an individual can own. So if you are selling to the enterprise that has got trillions, okay, in valuation, probably makes billions and billions in its annual revenues, trust me, they can afford your product. That's only 500,000 kwacha. So it's very lucrative. And you might want to consider that. Um, I, I am fortunate to have experienced B2B, and this is a model that we take seriously at Make Life International. And sometimes we wouldn't even rave too much about a public setting where there's B2C when we know we can 
be able to make certain profitability just from reaching a B2B client. So then another advantage in why we should be considering the B2B market is that it can be very flexible to carry out on your own schedule. So what this means is that when you are operating a company and you're selling to a B2B client, a B2B customer, at times you've got the flexibility to operate and carry it out on your own schedule because you do what we call a proposal for that client or for that customer where you're able to highlight the activities when they will be carried out. And the when really is what I'm focusing on schedule here. So sometimes you can actually schedule all the work to be done within a space of one month. Sometimes you can spread it to be done within the space of two weeks depending on how much work you're going to put in. So you can easily be able to manipulate the deliverables. You can assign more staff if you want to get stuff done sooner. You can be able to extend the duration, but at least falls to within the client's requirement. So there's that flexibility you can get to exercise for the most part uh, with a B2B clientele. Three other reasons are, uh, there's what we call reciprocal buying. Sometimes when you serve a B2B client, they come back and you can buy from them, they can buy from you. So you start building a, a form of community, a form of networking, a form of relationship. And that then guarantees future business for you. And when you've got certain guaranteed future business, it means that the chances of your business staying alive are greatly increased. Because every business person wants to know they've got some recurring income lying somewhere. That even though there's a season where they're not making so much money because they may be service-based, they've got some recurring incomes. And sometimes the value in having a B2B business model could allow for what we call reciprocal buying. I buy from you, you buy from me. And that consistency in keeping each other's businesses going forward can keep a great relationship. There's also what we call product specificity. Sometimes when it comes to delivering a product to a client, for example, maybe they want shirts. Vodafone back then where I go to work from, say we want shirts. They'll ask us to still ask uh, the supplier of t-shirts or we would ask the supplier of t-shirts that we want uh, red t-shirts, printed Vodafone right here and whatnot and whatnot. And the particular supplier will supply those particular t-shirts based on our specificity. Now what that happens, what that allows is that even next time when we want t-shirts, instead of having to go and re-specify to a new person, we'll just go to the person who knows how we like our stuff done. So that allows again for you to have repeat business because people, uh, people that buy, businesses that buy from other businesses normally don't want to change their vendors often because there's a lot of work that goes into that. Uh, even when you talk about the bureaucracy tables, so it went through a lot of channels to first get approved. So they don't want to do that often, over and over again. So if you'd land yourself a great B2B deal, there's a good chance you'll keep on having some repeat business because of how specific the whole process is and the product becomes. Then the fifth thing, and this is not the last thing, but this is the fifth thing I'm going to share with you why you should really consider B2B model for your business. The size of the B2B industry online is more massive than the B2C market. Estimations for e-com are in the trillions of dollars. I shared with you the time I did the e-commerce class and the estimations for how much e-com is going in 2020 alone is in the trillions of dollars. And you see how that's a massive industry. Many businesses today are already online and are actively buying it. Whereas consumers, for the most part, are still now warming into the session. They're warming into buying more stuff online. And you find for that reason, the B2B market and industry is already large online. And this also goes to say that the size of the industry, for example, South Africa itself, and I'm giving a South Africa as an example because it's really close to us and Zambia has got a similar operation model, has got a larger B2B market than a B2C market. For those of you who've done some economics, you already understand market, a market very well. A market is simply a place where buyers and sellers meet, all right? And they exchange value. They can exchange wages, 
for labor and whatnot. And the B2C market stands alone, the B2B market stands alone. We're not talking about size here, I'm talking about the market size. The, 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 um, the number of players that are involved that are willing to buy. Remember, at the end of the day, what defines your market is how many people are willing to buy and have the capacity to buy. And you find with the B2C market, at times you may have willingness, but lack the capacity to buy. They do not have the amount of money to buy for your type of product. So these are reasons you should be considering B2B. So to move on further to our first, uh, our first point today is an introduction to B2B sales and marketing. I've already done a bit of this, but I want to get more into those details, those, those juicy elements that are going to help you understand this and become a pro, okay, well, not become a pro overnight, but at least get you started to becoming a professional. So what do you learn when we talk of introduction? Well, these are a few things I want to bring into perspective, right? There's a difference between B2B and B2C markets, right? And I'm gonna share a bit with you on the RFPs, the procurement rules, and the professional buyer versus the consumer. But before I share this, let me just bring in two things that make this difference, okay? Number one, there's a difference in the target market. Like I said, I didn't make this text heavy. So there's a difference in the target market. And number two, there's a difference in the sales processes, okay? So now the target market is different for this regard. Hold on to these, these particular notes. I want to share a bit on them. But for now, let me just build the base before I talk about the RFPs, which are the request for proposals. So number one, there's a need to understand the market. There's a difference in the target market. Like I mentioned, in a B2C arrangement, you are selling to the end consumer. This person is probably making an emotional buy. They're more concerned on how they'll look, if it's a nice dress. They're concerned about what uh, John will say about that dress. They're concerned about... Um, the food they will eat. So they're able to make a decision because they are the ones using the product. So as a target market, that B2C, that B2C target market is different from the B2B target market. For the B2C, it's the end consumer making the decision. So they're making more emotional decisions to buy your product, your service. But the B2B, with what they call a B2, uh, what they call a, a procurement officer, all right? So this is a professional buyer. They've been trained. Some of them have gone to school on how to buy. These people are good at negotiating deals. These are people are not looking for the emotional things that they'll get from the deal. These people are trying to buy based on quality. So they're going to take up so many requests for proposals. They're going to look at so many bidders and they're looking for the best deal. So there's a difference in the target market. And for you to really understand the difference between the B2B and the B2C, number one, like I said, you need to understand there's a difference in the target market. The people buying are different. The B2C is normally the end consumer. For those of you that just joined us, let me just emphasize on that point. It's the end consumer. And they're going to be buying based on emotions. But the B2B person, they're a professional buyer. They're in the procurement office. They, they know how to look for for loopholes, they know how to search you, they know how to interrogate your product. These guys are on a mission, they are paid to get the best deal for the company. So, like I said, the B2B market is lucrative, it's got money, but it can be challenging. And that's why it's important for you to be here tonight. The things I'm sharing with you are going to help you a great deal on being able to lock yourself into B2B deals because it's very vital that you get into this lucrative business. But it's challenging, and I'm going to help you so that it becomes more simpler for you because, like I said, knowledge is what the advantage bringer. And I'm about to give you that advantage in the market space from those that do not know what we're sharing. Before I share, like I said, before I share these three points, I'm sharing the difference between the B2B and B2C, and then I'm going to expound on this. So there's a difference in target market. The second thing is you need to understand that there's a difference in the sales process. How you sell to a person in the B2C, which is the business to consumer market, is different how you sell to the people in the B2B, all right, which could be the professional buyers here. The sales process is different. You know, the sales process could be like one, they need to, you need to qualify whether the lead is, is a good lead for your company. 
stuff like exploring the objectives, which I'm going to share, things like the scope of the offering and whatnot. By qualifying the lead, and we're going to share that very soon, we're talking about being able to determine whether this particular business is actually able to buy from you. Okay, so there's a difference with that. The way you qualify a consumer and the way you qualify a business is a different way. And I'll share that a bit. Now back to the, the slides here. What is the RFP? These are what we call requests for proposals. If you've ever got engaged in any B2B sales or B2B marketing, you may find it on Gold Zambia Jobs today. Like we love to look at jobs there and bid for them as well. You're going to find companies that are in need of services, in need of products. They're going to be able to put up a request for proposal. So this is why they call for companies to bid for the deal. They're going to mention they're going to mention to you what they require. They're going to tell you to say, no, for you to bid for this job, you need three years experience, okay? You, they're going to tell you, you need to have this particular level of, of income. This, they're going to share such a lot of things. They're going to show you, you need to share your portfolio. Who have you worked with in the past? So there's requests for proposals. And I'm going to share with you just right now how you can actually go about being able to tackle this if you had some level of disadvantage. So, like I said, there's a difference. For a business to consumer, they're not going to tell you, give me an, a request for proposal. I mean, if someone walks into your store and they love a jacket, they're going to buy it. They're not going to start telling you, first send a proposal to my email. No, no, no. They are ready to buy. So, that's a difference already. All right? There's that difference. That's very vivid. Then, um, there's procurement rules. So, now, in the B2B market, the person who's buying may have procurement rules. Remember I talked about this professional person. So they may be taught stuff like uh, for you to, for us to buy anything, they may be told that you need to look at a certain thing, certain things about the particular buy. And some of those things can include that this person must be an approved vendor. If you're in engineering like I am, you're going to find out that there are certain things that, there are certain deals you can't get until you're at a certain level in terms of um, of licensing so you need to understand the procurement rules for the particular person you're selling to okay it becomes very very key for you to know what rules are at play here so the rules can be like do i need uh, should i be an approved vendor for me to supply these services for example in the finance sector uh, they're going to require you maybe to have a zika license you must be a licensed uh, auditor for your firm to have an opportunity. So such things become very key when it comes to selling the B2B. It's different from the B2C. The B2C person will walk up and say, I love your graphics. I love how you take photos. I'm willing to pay now. But for the businesses, they're going to have what we call procurement rules that the people that are buying for them will follow. Stuff like approved, are there approved vendors? For example, or maybe they should take up at least three price quotes as a minimum. So meaning that when you, when you go to them, you can't just give them one, one price quotation. You may be for the same services, you have, to, you have to price them three different models. And for those of you who've been hearing me speak in these sessions for a long time, I tell you that at Make Life, we normally have a three price model and I've shared with you some of the secrets as to why that is the case. So sometimes they're gonna tell them you need to take up a minimum of three price quotations. And they may tell them stuff like, you must only get for the lowest quote that falls within our budget. So you see, there's already quite a number of rules that get into that, but this should not make you afraid. The fact that you're here tonight, I'm about to help you with this. The third thing is that, you know, there's professional buyer versus the consumer. I shared a bit of this when I was talking about understanding the market. And like I said, I was going to expound more with these three points. The B2B have got, some of them have got departments. I mean, you can't go sell to a business that is huge in Zambia like Tredkins without it passing through the procurement office. You can't go sell to Unza. I once was selling to Unza a particular deal for one of my clients. I had to first go to the procurement offices. I went to uh, Evelyn Hall and I had to go through the procurement offices. I had to drop the proposals. I had to drop the bids. Why? It's because these guys have got professional teams looking at it. It's not one person making the decision for them. So. The professional buyer, there's a way that they have. They've got procurement rules, and you need to understand the ball game that the sales process is different. The, the target market has a different way of thinking. 
And when you understand that even your strategy is different, you won't go to a business trying to sell to them like you're selling to a consumer. You're going to go making sure you do your homework. You see, one of the reasons why I make life, we were privileged to win the Sadiq Innovation Challenge is because we understood that in as much as it was a competition, we were dealing with businesses. We were being looked at by Finmac Trust, by Bongo Hive, by FSB Zambia. And we understood that for you to sell better, to, whether you're selling an idea, you're selling a service, we made sure we studied the judging criteria. Okay, and here begins me beginning to let you know how you break this particular system. We studied the judging criteria. We really wanted to understand what are they looking for. Remember, businesses think rationally. They're not thinking based on emotions for the most part because no one person buying. They've got a set of rules. They've got policies. They've got procurement rules. So these guys can follow the requirements to the T. So if you want to stand a good chance to get in a deal for a large company, make sure you read the bids thoroughly. Make sure you understand the procurement rules. And where you find yourself lacking in say, the request for proposals, you can complement this by getting other people to partner with you. For example, if they tell you they're looking for a consultancy firm that needs this and this, if you guys don't have the experience, partner with a consultancy firm that has the experience they're looking for. Partner with a brother who's got a PhD. If you see there's a PhD requirement, put your CVs together and go for that bill. Because if you just do it as you, They've already still, it's like they've told you what they're going to be assessing you for in an exam, and you should decide to hand in a half filled paper. Trust me, they're going to mark you 50% and tell you that you failed. We wanted someone in the 90th percentile. So you really need to understand that B2B people are more rational than they are emotional. So if you're going to sell to them, you need to think numerically, like I shared before when I was talking about perception. So make sure those of you who've missed sessions before, the team will share to you the link to the entrepreneurs team. When you are there in the WhatsApp group, ask that they share with you some of these sessions. When I talked about perspective, I told you that perspective has got two things. There's rational and numerical thinking, and then there's also the psychological, which falls in the emotional. When you talk about rational and numerical, you're talking about economics and technology. But let me not share too much of that because I've already shared that before. What I'm trying to bring to your attention is that whereas a consumer will perceive value based on the emotional value for the most part, the psychology, how they feel about your product. The B2B is going to express interest based on the rational parts, the numerical parts. Is this economic for us? So they'll look for things like how affordable is it? How efficient is it? How fast can this be done? You know, who's on the team? So these guys are looking at the numbers. They look at the numbers you give to them. So you can't get your numbers wrong. Do your research, get your numbers right. Because they'll be looking at the numbers, how, how numerical it is. Don't use words that describe things. Use numbers, use tables, use Gantt charts. Be very rational in thought. If you can think like that, trust me, you're going to start having the deals you want that can get you to a place. One deal with a B2B client, can set you apart. It can, it can make a whole difference for your company. If you sell cakes, like I know Simba sells cakes here, if she can get a company to start buying her cakes, she's going to have serious paychecks. Like I put it, this is the market that has got the big paychecks. But how do you get into it? Think rationally, think numerically. Remember they've got a request for proposals. Study their request for proposals. What are their requirements? What are their procurement rules? What are they looking to get from me? and make sure you meet those. If you want, put that as a checkbox. For us, when we were looking at the judging criteria, we were checking ourselves. Check one, we've done this. Check two, we've done this. Until you hit every box correctly, then you're more likely to get a deal. Like I said, if you don't meet all the requirements, partner, collaborate. Entrepreneurs uh, in, with Eska Arts love what they say, connect, says, uh, they say, um, what do they put it as? Uh, con create, connect, collaborate. That's what they say, create, connect, collaborate. They believe in collaboration and we definitely love that. We definitely support that. Find who you can collaborate with. So I've shared quite a bit in this. I hope this is clear because of time. Let me move on again to the second thing, the B2B marketing and sales processes. Don't worry for those of you who joined in late, we will share this recording for a limited time so that you can benefit from it. But now that you've understood the differences between B2C and B2B, you've understood that the B2B market has got professional buyers 
okay, these are people in the procurement offices. These are sales people. These are people that are trained to buy for the company. They know how to be thinking rationally, how to get quality out, how to ask for proposals and whatnot. And the B2C guys, they're thinking emotionally. They want, they are the end consumer. They will actually use the product. You know, so if you understand the differences, you understand there's a difference in the sales processes. Now let me get into in-depth stuff about some of these processes. Remember tonight, we're talking about you being the salesperson. So I want to be able to share it from that perspective. So now I want to share just a few things here, the buying process. So when talk about the buying process, this is the process where the person that you want to sell to will be going through in their mind. First and foremost, they're going to prepare a request for, uh, a request for proposals. So that's supposed to be R-I-E-P, not F, sorry. Uh, so they're going to prepare a request for proposals. So they may put it up on a site like Go Zambia Jobs. They may put it up on LinkedIn. Because if you're a business and you want to start selling to a business, let me recommend to you platforms you should be looking at. Be looking at Go Zambia Jobs. Be looking at LinkedIn for opportunities. Okay? Because that's where businesses normally are. Remember, a business requires traffic. And for you to get traffic, go to the place where the traffic sources are the richest. So don't expect to sell to businesses and just be on Facebook. Facebook is largely a consumer marketplace. But places like LinkedIn, places like Instagram, places like uh, Go Zambia Jobs for us who are locally based are great places for B2B traffic. So when you're on those particular platforms, you realize that they'll send out a lot of call for bids, requests for proposals, requests for quotations. So their buying process is such that when they have that, they will expect you to submit, you know, at a certain date. They'll expect you to submit before a certain date your request for proposals. And those of you who joined LA, you've, you've heard how I've told you for you to plan for those. Do it like a checklist. Make sure you check each of those boxes. Make sure that you facilitate collaboration where you find yourself lacking. Make sure that you, you pay particular detail to the numerical aspect, the numbers that are required. When you have that in place, you submit your loaded bid for them. Another thing to note about you sub submitting that to them, when they call for request for proposals, they are always looking to get the most affordable deal. They are always looking to get the most affordable deal. That's why they ask for so many quotations. But then at times, they may be able to trade off quality for quantity. Sometimes they're going to do the reverse. But what normally happens is that they've got a certain threshold. They are going to know, you might be tempted to say, okay, let's us charge a very little amount so that they should take us. But remember, even when they prepare their request for proposals, they have a certain mindset as to how much this will cost. So they've got what they call their value in expectation. So they might be expecting that they are willing to spend 10000 or they're willing to spend a hundred thousand. So if you submit a, a request for proposal with a budget that's only aimed at 40,000 and they have a hundred thousand budget, they may not take you seriously because they're going to ask themselves the question, are these people going to give us the quality that we look for? So you have to be careful to not undercharge, but be very careful to not overprice because if you overprice, you may be beaten by someone who charges the right amount. So some of you may want to ask me a very difficult question like, how then do I know what's the right amount? This is how you know what's the right amount. Your cost, know your costs, know how much you want to sell it, make sure you've got a reasonable profit. Reasonable profits for service businesses can be 100 to less. Services normally have got quite a huge profit margin. But for a product, if you've got a 100% profit margin, probably you are a bit too costly. So you need to understand those dynamics. If you need further help, you can reach out to Make Live. I'll share our details. We can help you prepare your request for proposals and bids, but that's going to come at a fee. For now, I'm sharing with you the process, and please understand that. So if you've understood this, this is what I call request for quotations. This is where you prepare quotations. And like I said, some of them in the buying process have got a requirement to at least receive three quotation price points. So you need to be able to send quotations for a varying, like, I, like I've shared before, packages. So you can package your product differently and code for them differently. So with that said, allow me to move on because we have got nine minutes to the end. So let me run you through the sales process. Now this is what you will be doing 
to actually qualify leads to actually get your sales done. So now, there's what they call to qualify the lead, okay? So if you're running a business, for example, you are running uh, a business that's entitled Life Design Techs, right? So now, you want to qualify the leads. These are business leads, remember? There's what they call mandates, okay? That's an acronym, and you, I need you to write that down, mandates. So it's an acronym, so you can write it going vertically downwards, the word mandate. M stands for money. A stands for authority. N stands for the needs. And D stands for desire. A, T, E, well, they're just fillers here, but we focus on M, A, N, and D, okay? So now when we talk about money, as a, if you want to sell to, the B to, to a B2B company, you need to first ask yourself, do they have the money to afford my services or product? And I like how someone puts it. If that company earns, uh, say, five figures, okay, a five figure which could be like 50,000 in revenues annually, and your product or service is also five figures, there's a good chance they can't afford your product. If in a month, let's say, uh, which business can, let's just say Exca Arts, if Exca Arts makes, uh, maybe say uh, 5,000 a month, probably they make more. Okay, that's a four figure uh, revenue that they make. I can go sell to them a biz something, a product, and be hoping for them to buy if it's also four figures. It's 4,000. Because then they've got so many other things to do in that amount of money. They've got profits, they've got operations, they've got marketing, they've got advertisement. So I already know that this client may be interested but they may not have the money to buy my product. So as a B2B person, you want to be able to have credibility by only targeting people that will actually afford your product. I mean, it sounds a bit crude, but I, I normally tell staff at Make Life, you know, when we were in the office the other day and we we're going to, we undergoing a training, and I was telling them to say, look, we don't, we don't sell to everybody. We've got a persona for a reason. We don't look to please everybody we sell to the people that we target and as a business person you need to come to that frame of mind where you understand those dynamics so ask yourself if you want to qualify whether this business is able to buy your product do they have the money make sure that if there are six figures then your product is probably five figures you know if they're making five hundred thousand they probably can afford something that's four thousand that's fifty thousand they could afford that Okay, then you need to check A, the authority. Remember, it's mandate written down. Now, you need to find out the person you're communicating to, do they have the authority to authorize that buy? Because you can spend your time using nice words to market to them, to sell to them, but then they can't make the decision. So you want to make sure that you deal with the person that can make the decision. Now, some of you may enter an office and you're going to find bureaucracy uh, closing you out. Uh, you find, for example, the secretary and you can't reach this particular person that you actually can make the authority. This is how I've come across, how I've actually gone around that. I try to find out who that person is. First, know who's the actual person. Is it the managing director for that company that makes the decision? When I found out the managing director, I go research this person on Facebook. I research them on LinkedIn and try to find out who do they know who I know. Because the first way to break bureaucracy sometimes is by going through someone you know. If that doesn't work out, I try to get directly in touch with them by being able to send them a message via their platform, whether it's Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn. I try to get into their box if I can find their email. And when you get into an important person's inbox, you want to make sure that you tell them stuff that are valid. Don't start wasting their time by saying, hi, Hello, because they're going to block you. Make sure you go direct to the point. Greet them, but go direct to the point. I came to your office the other day. I wasn't able to get you, but I feel there's something that Make Life International can't do without. It involves ABC, the ABC, a short elevator pitch. Get them interested and put your call to action and say, kindly contact me on this email. I'll have an appointment with you. Trust me, you'll be amazed how far that action can go. You need to make sure that you're talking to the person with the authority. If bureaucracy closes you at the door, 
today the world is so connected. Don't be discouraged and just keep on going there every Monday. Go look for them online and find a way to, in a short space of time, sell yourself to them. I hope I'm clear. Remember then the third thing is the needs. Remember I was talking about qualifying a lead here. And I told you to write mandates vertically downright. M means money. Do they have the money to buy from me? This, this particular business. The second thing is the person I'm talking to, an authority to be able to decide that they can buy this for the company. Or they're just a person who can talk to you but not buy. Make sure you're talking to the person, the authority. The third thing is you really need to be, uh, you need to be honest with yourself. Does that company need what you're selling? When you come to Make Life, the first thing we do for you is we assess your problem. We really want to solve the actual problem you're facing. We, we, we believe that as doctors of management, we don't want to diagnose malaria by giving you fragile, which is for a stomach pain. We're going to give you fancy that. We're going to give you the actual problem. So if we identify that we can't solve your problem, we'll be genuine and tell you that we know someone who can. Because you don't want to try to start becoming what many businesses do when they're starting up, where they want to be the everything for everything. Before they know it, you're spreading your finances thinly. You're always, you, you, you're holding more, you're holding more departments than you should. And before you know it, your business is dying because it's over dynamic and it's not niche in a way. So you need to understand that. The fourth thing is you need to understand the desire. Do these people desire to buy? If these four things are checked, they can they have the money, the budget to buy from you. They are the authority person. They need your product. You've assessed that they really need your product, whether it's a service, and you know they've got a desire, then you qualify them as a lead. What now remains is for you to nature them, all right? You begin to nature them. And this, to nature them, you need to explore the objectives. What ways can you be able to meet their objectives? What alternatives are there? Like, if you're going to give a three price quotation what alternatives are there then when you've done that you need to scoop the offering if you've done your pitch and understood it make sure you skip the deal go for the queue uh there's the bible says this and i love this it says ask and you shall be given don't be afraid to ask for the deal and say can we have this deal this is our proposal this is how much we are offering to give to be able to sell this product to you can this deal be agreed and once that happens develop a verbal agreement with the person then move on to close the deal by signing the deal. This should be your sales process. I wish I could share much, but this is 2029 and I love to keep time. I'm gonna share this recording. I'm gonna allow Mondoka to take it over. So these are our handles for Make Live and my personal handles for those of you that want to reach me. If you need help with your bids, you can reach out to us, but this is enough for you. But a business needs traffic. So make sure you get in touch if this is helpful for you. I'm gonna allow uh, Mondoka, the CEO,